am I the arsehole for telling my husband that if he fights for custody of his kids, I will divorce him? Story time. So I have never had the desire to have kids. But do I feel like I ever will, to be honest? I don't want to have nor care for anyone else's children. So I married my husband, who we will call Steve. And I had absolutely no idea that Steve was a dad until five years days ago. I'm a self-employed girly so my wage is really good for the amount of working hours that I have to do. I'm quite flexible in the hours that I work. So in terms of our finances we have a joint account which all of our bills and like rent and stuff comes out of. Then we have our own separate accounts for fun money and savings. So Steve sat me down about four or five days ago and said I haven't been completely honest with you. Great babe we've only been married for a year or whatever. Steve tells me that he doesn't have one child. He actually has two children when i thought he didn't have any and the eldest is 10 the youngest is seven apparently he's been paying regular child support for them ever since both of them were born but over the years of paying the child support this has dipped into his fun money and now steve would like some of that fun money to be his again he doesn't really want to be paying for the kids he wants to have fun like he sees me have fun so now his plan is to fight for 50 50 custody because this will mean that he pays less child support and as i'm sure you can imagine i was absolutely furious like i'm sorry how are you about to lie to me about having two children just bizarre behavior so i just outright told him that if you wanted to apply for 50 50 custody that is absolutely fine but i would be divorcing him not even just because of the kids like the fact that you lied to me so easily as well mm, scary I haven't tried this foundation before so this could go very wrong but we do have a prenup in place so i would be fully protected still get 100 percent of my business and i'd get the house because it was mine that was passed on from my grandma steve <laughs> then i had the absolute nerve the goal bloody gumption to call me the arsehole in this situation i'm sorry can anyone see my two kids that i never told my life partner about running around because i can't mm. He also told me that I would be in the wrong if I didn't step up to be a stepmom. Mm, I'm not too sure that that is how this works, Steve. He told me that it was time for me to step up so that he could have fun. So realistically, it's not even about getting the kids back. It's about him being able to save money. Am I in the wrong for telling my friend that if she couldn't keep up because of her disability, she just shouldn't come? I, 26 female, have had a pretty close group of friends. We have this one girl in our group, Sadie, 27 female. She has a disability that is mostly manageable through medication. Despite this, Sadie has a bad habit of forgetting to take her pills right before we do something that she isn't interested in doing. This time, it was on a friend group trip we've been planning for over a year. We each decided to take a day and plan an activity that the whole group would participate in. We also rented a van together to get to our destination as that was the most ideal situation. The first issue with Sadie came up when we were getting to our destination. Due to the length of the drive, everyone was going to be driving for an hour to get there. Right before it was Sadie's turn, she had a flare up and couldn't drive. Our friend took over. The next morning, my friend had planned a tour of the town. We all reminded Sadie several times to take her medication as this was an expensive tour and we did not want it to be cut short. Well, she had forgotten and the tour had to be cut short. This is when I got genuinely upset because now my money was being wasted. Throughout the week, she had flare ups pretty often. The actual fight that led to this post occurred on my day though. The previous day, Sadie had no flare-ups. It was also her day to plan. This was because she had set alarms to take her medication regularly so that she would be okay. We all reminded her to please take her pills like that again. I decided to take all my friends on a trail ride on horses as the trails in this town are known for being exceptionally beautiful. We paid extra for the basic lesson prior to the trail. In the basics lesson, we were all paired off based on our experience and performance in the small arena that they had. I was paired with Sadie. Well, one-fourth of the way through the trail, she started having a flare-up. I told her that I wouldn't be turning around as this was expensive and I was truly looking forward to this. She begged me to turn around. Finally, the ranger told us that I had to turn around as she was my partner. In the car, I told her that she knew how important this was to me and that she should have just taken her pills. She told me that I was being ableist and that I didn't know what the pills did to her. We got into a huge argument in which I said, if your disability can't take being a good friend, then maybe you shouldn't come on these trips anyway. While I agreed that this was pretty harsh, I didn't think I was in the wrong considering that she had cost us so much money over the years for simply not wanting to do something. My other friends agree that Sadie is inconvenient at times, but I should have been more sensitive to her condition. I'm honestly torn on whether to apologize or not. I saved my son from developing brain damage. I stayed in hospital for two days after I had my son to make sure that I was okay because I had preeclampsia during pregnancy and they just wanted to monitor me and monitor my blood pressure. When we were discharged from the hospital, I was told my son was fully healthy, everything was fine, he didn't have jaundice, he didn't have anything and we were okay to go home. The day after we got home, when he was three days old, I noticed he started going a little bit yellow and I was a bit concerned. So when the midwife came to do a check, bearing in mind, 
by the way i had a private midwife after uh, i left the hospital and came home um because i thought this was going to be the best care for him i raised this with her and i told her that i was worried about how yellow he was and she told me everything was fine and he didn't look yellow and that i had no reason to worry and that because he was a mixed race baby that his skin was probably just a bit darker and that was the reason why he was that color so i was like okay cool fine when she came back for the day five checkup, I was even more concerned because at this point he had gone a lot more yellow. So when she came, I said, uh, he's definitely got more yellow. And she was like, yeah, he is yellow, but I think he's fine. She was like, is he eating as normal? Is he pooing as normal? I'm like, I don't know what normal is because he's literally only a few days old. Like, how are you meant to know what normal is? So I said that to her and she was like, no, I think he's fine if he is pooing and at the time he was so sleepy like but she said that was normal for newborns anyways i was still worried so i was like absolutely not contacted a doctor the doctor told me to give it a couple days see how he goes and you know everything should be fine he's probably got mild jaundice and that was it I still felt like something wasn't right, so I contacted a private GP to come out to our house and check up on him. This was about 7pm at night. He came out, checked on him, and he had a slight temperature, uh, uh, a bit of a fever. So he recommended that we go to the A&E at the hospital uh, just to get him checked over again and make sure that everything was fine. So we did. So we had the blood test done at 10 o'clock at the hospital. They let us go home. They had confirmed that he definitely had jaundice. They didn't think it was as bad as it was going to be. Uh, so they let us go home and wait for the test results. We literally got home. The minute we got home, I got a call back from the hospital saying, hi, you need to get back to the hospital immediately. Um, there's an emergency. And I started freaking out because I thought they were going to call us and tell us that everything was okay. But I just wanted the reassurance. So we headed back to the hospital. We got there at about 1 a.m. And as soon as we got there, a consultant came in and she told us that she needed to get Grayson on a drip straight away and they needed to get him under some UV lights because he has severe jaundice. And at the time, I didn't know what jaundice could do, but uh, if jaundice gets to a certain level, it can affect their brain, which can affect their hearing, their sight, uh, and it can basically just cause brain damage. Um, I don't know fully, uh, like obviously all the ins and outs of it, because at the time I was only five days postpartum and I was so delirious and I was just freaking out and I was like, just get him all the care that he needs. Like we were just so shocked by what we had heard, but we still didn't think it was going to get as bad as it did. They tried a few times to get the drip in and the consultant that was there couldn't get it into his arm. They tried different places to get it in. They couldn't do it. I couldn't be in the room while they did this because he's screaming absolutely broke my heart. Eventually they got it. They put him under the UV lights for six hours uh, until 8 a.m. And by 8 a.m., more consultants came in the room. Um, maybe there was two more that joined just to give us so much information. My brain couldn't even process it. After having been on the lights and on the drip for six hours, his bilirubin levels haven't hadn't improved. Bilirubin is what causes jaundice. It's in your blood. Uh, every normal person would have about a bilirubin level of 30. Grayson's level was 500. Um, so the treatment level for the UV lights for bilirubin is 250. The treatment, <laughs> the treatment level for a blood transfusion for bilirubin is 350. And obviously Grayson's was at 500 and brain damage happens at 700. Um, so he was obviously very near that level. Now, when these consultants came in, by the way, a consultant is like a top doctor in their field. So they are pediatricians, but they were just called consultants. Um, they basically just came in to tell us that Grayson's levels were significantly high. And if he didn't get in to do a blood transfusion soon, they would just keep raising, uh, obviously, which could then cause brain damage. And they didn't know at this point if he had had any brain damage from how high his levels were. So they've come in and they've basically said that the, the treatment that he's currently getting isn't working on him. And we need to get him into the PICU, which is called the PICU because it's I think it's the pediatric intensive care unit uh, so that they can start the blood transfusion before his levels raise even more. I was just so overwhelmed with how much was going on. I, I didn't even have time to process anything and then all these nurses were in the room rolling his bed into the PICU to start the blood transfusion because they had to work quickly with how quick his levels were raising. By the way, he was getting blood tests done every two hours to check these levels and that's how they knew they were just getting higher and higher and that the UV lights and the drip that he had in wasn't working. As soon as we got up to the PICU, they got a line into his groin to start the blood transfusion 
and while they were doing this and doing everything else um obviously they had to sedate him and when they sedated him before this he had pauses in his breathing but not for like a significant amount of times uh they came back into the room and let us know that they had to put grayson on a ventilator because he stopped breathing for a significant amount of time and when i say it like it makes me want to cry and it breaks my heart because that that, oh, that that news for your at the time six day old baby is just heartbreaking like it was just so much information at once and my hormones were all over the place as well like I was just constantly crying it felt like my heart was broken like I can't even explain the pain that I went through I just needed a minute there um so they said do you want to go and see him before we start the blood transfusion um I went into the room and I just broke down I, I couldn't even look at him he just had tubes in his mouth in his nose um his eyes were closed shut um he had all these lines in him it was you, you, it's just not a way that you want to see your baby you know and they had to keep him under the uv lights while they were doing the blood transfusion as well and the blood transfusion took about five hours it just wasn't nice to see uh they had to do like five mils at a time because the blood transfusion is where they take all the blood out of his body and replace it with new blood to help bring that level down significantly because of how high it was thankfully the blood transfusion did work to a certain extent it brought it down a lot it brought it down to 160 um and then we stayed in the picu for another 24 hours then we were transferred out of the picu to another ward where he was monitored for a few more days he was on a feeding tube because he was still on the ventilator for the time that we were in the picu and then he was on a feeding tube for two days after that because he was just so young that i don't know they just needed to feed him that way because he wasn't latching and they needed to make sure he was getting enough fluids to help uh wash out the the belly ribbon in his body um and to stay hydrated so they had to monitor how much was going into his stomach so i couldn't breastfeed at the time i was exclusively pumping well i was trying to pump and just go through everything at the same time to make sure i was feeding him and it was just a lot it was a lot a lot a lot i can't even explain it it just was like a million miles an hour with everything that was going on so once he was off his feeding tube and they took the little oxygen 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 tube out of his nose that they had there after he was on the ventilator and everything was stable we just went to another ward for another night to just make sure that he was going to be okay without any of the extra things that he had and then once all of that was over um they let us go home when his belly ribbon levels were at around 180 when they let us go home they took all of his lines out and he got an infection from the one that he had in his groin so i had to monitor that with um and put like this ointment on it and yeah whatever but then he was going in every day anyways to keep getting blood tests to make sure it was staying down but it wasn't it kept rising again and i was just stressing out so i was googling everything to try and find out how i could help his belly ribbon stay down and i found out on google that apparently breast milk affects your belly ribbon levels and it can keep it going it's like staying high spoke to the doctor she also agreed and she thought that might be why so i added a bit of formula into his diet and then it helped stabilize his levels um so right now while well, they went up to like 220 again so so close to needing treatment once i put the formula in they went back down to like 190 where which is what they're at right now we still don't know what caused everything um we were in hospital for about a week and they ran so many tests to try and find out what caused it and they still couldn't find any answers um he had a lumbar puncture he had so many blood tests and they don't really have answers but we do have a slight idea we went back yesterday to test both him and myself because they think it was something he could have picked up in pregnancy and infection but we don't know for certain so i'll let you guys know once we do know but He's okay now. Um, we are still running tests on his hearing and on his eyesight just to make sure nothing was affected at the time. I really felt like it was important for me to share this story because I just think that as a mom, especially a new mom, you just trust medical professionals over your own instincts. You feel like you don't know what you're talking about. But at the same time, you just get this motherly instinct the minute your baby is born. And if you feel like something is wrong with your baby, go and get them checked. No matter if you feel like you're a nuisance to anybody, their health is literally all that matters. So just go to the hospital. Because if I could go back and do things differently on day three, when I saw that little bit of yellow in him, like I just wish I took him to A&E or I wish I, I, I called that private GP to come to my house like there's a million things that I would do differently now and I know when I was at the hospital they told me that they hadn't done a blood transfusion on a baby that little um in two years actually for belly ribbon levels and 
it's not common that there is such high bilirubin levels in a baby but at the same time you'd rather be safe than sorry and if they want to give your baby a blood test at the hospital to check let them do it if you know the the medical professionals in this country are actually so amazing um all the doctors at the hospital i can't thank them enough for what they did for our little boy and the, the care that he's still getting now till this day is just incredible like the pediatrician calls me all the time to check up on him to call him in for more tests and now he might be on medication for the next year of his life but even if he is i know he's going to be okay because he had the most amazing care so this is how I am trying to heal my relationship with money. Little backstory about my relationship with money is that my parents did really well, lost it all, lost the house, lost everything. So that definitely created a scarcity mindset for me. It made me feel like whenever I had money to hold on to it really, just like really tightly because I just never know when it was just gonna go away, you know? Because I saw it just go away so quickly in my childhood. The number one fucking thing people tell you, they're like, don't, don't hold on to it so tightly like don't act like you're never gonna have it ever again it's true like money is an energy and the way you act towards the energy da, 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 it's like your money flow whatever the past year when i started making a good amount of money i saw not only my scarcity mindset but like my mother's too that she still has no hate to that bitch whatsoever because she's living this life for the first time too none of this is to blame her it's just things that i've realized but i found myself getting anxious over so many things money related like number one a fucking accountant and doing tax I saw a TikTok that was like, you're never supposed to make decisions out of fear or like with money. Like you're never supposed to be scared into making a decision with money. And let me give you an example. Last year is when I became a full-time influencer and I have to hire like a special kind of accountant for that or just like a fucking accountant in general. Like TurboTax can't do the job anymore. My mother was like, you need to hire an accountant right fucking now or else you're going to prison. Like, no, I literally kid you not. The woman was like, you're going to jail. Like I was genuinely convinced I was going to be like an orange jumpsuit because I had not hired a fucking accountant yet. Mind you it was just like january and i had like maybe one month of brand deals my mother was like no you're going to prison like you need to hire someone immediately you know what i did i googled accountant and i hired the first man that came up and i ended up paying that fucker so much money guess what he had absolutely no idea anything about influencer taxes i had no idea anything about taxes like if you guys remember i hated that man like i really did not like that man just because like he and it's honestly not his fault he just i mean i guess it kind of fucking is i'm gonna have to google that i'm gonna have to google that and i was like okay well i don't know and he was like well i don't know and i was like okay well you're the expert like i'm paying you so much fucking money like maybe you should know he just wasn't familiar with influencer taxes and i wasn't familiar with taxes i was so convinced i was going to prison because i listened to my mother that i was like okay i have to hire anybody and i ended up spending triple the amount of money hiring this random fuck if i had just waited and because my team now like referred me to somebody and i'm going to talk about her in a minute because she really changed my life my team now was like no you need a business manager but i was so fucking frightened by my mother that i was like i just hired literally anybody and i paid him so much fucking money for no he did absolutely nothing because i'm not blaming her it was my i should have never let her fear get in my head but at the end of the day that's the only person that taught me about money like her Whatever your mom says you're kind of gonna do you know especially when you're in a new field and you don't know what the fuck you're doing number one thing i really with money and healing my relationship with money is don't make fear-based decisions but i just like fear of money got so bad i started just like ghosting my accountant like i really didn't want to hear from him and i knew i needed to fire him because i was hiring a business manager and i just like literally i just I was so scared I was ghosting. Anyways, fast forward, I I fired that weird accountant and I hire my now business manager. We're gonna call her Tina. My team was like, no, you need a business manager. Like you wanna just do these things correctly. My first month working with Tina, I was ghosting her like the entire time. I kid you not, she would be asking me for documents, ghosting. Because I was just so fearful. Like I was just so scared. And the talk of money, and just thinking about it in general, being in this brand new field, like knowing nothing. And I had nobody to rely on really besides my team that knew anything, but like nobody close to me. Like I could, I realized I had to stop talking to my mom. Not in general, just like about money and stuff like that, because she was just creating such like a fear-based mindset for me. Also, I just think in general, me personally, I cannot talk about money with really anyone else unless it's a trusted professional. For example, once again, don't know why I did this. When I told my mom the amount of rent that I'll be paying in LA, she lost her fucking mind. She was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you do that kind of thing? And I was like, well, this is what I feel comfortable spending. She's like, you have no idea what you're doing. Or even if I told like 
let's say a close friend or something they're like oh my god that's like so much like what are you sure you know what you're doing are you sure you know what you're doing and also it's like no i don't know what the fuck i'm doing so i'm even like 20 times more scared and so I d i'm ghosting my business manager i, I don't want to talk to her i don't want to do deal with any of this in my head the more i could push it off the better it was for me because i wasn't having to deal with it that's another thing that's helping me heal my relationship with money is like i have a couple trusted people in my life who I can talk about money openly and freely with, like Sissy being one of them. Sissy taught me everything I needed to know from like credit cards, cause my mom convinced me if I got a credit card, I was gonna be like $70,000 in debt. And you know what? Just like people that have a scarcity mindset of money too, they were not helping my relationship with money. I was letting them impact me way too much. I ended up finally like not ghosting my business manager anymore. Well, mainly because I was like, how much should I be spending in rent in LA? And she was like, well, I'm not doing that until we have a talk. She's like, I'm not telling you that number until we have a talk. And I was like, fuck, she like knows I'm ghosting. She knows I'm ghosting her. I was like, okay, Libby, like boss the fuck up. Like boss the fuck up. And you guys, that talk I had with her, I, she didn't even do anything special. It's just like the way that she talked to, she, the way she talks about money, so calmly. She's so fine with it and we were going through all of my finances everything and i for the first time in my life i feel like i just felt so comfortable that amount of rent that um my mom was like what the fuck is wrong with you was the exact amount that she she suggested for me to be spending in that moment is when i realized i was like okay i need to trust myself Honestly, like i did talk a lot of shit about my mom in this but that was never the intent i guess the intent more is about breaking generational trauma surrounding money that's what i'm actively doing I need to trust myself more and i need to trust the people that i hired around me more as well not ghost them also didn't realize that my fear of money was this bad and like what was causing it and then at the end of the day when i sit down and i ask myself like hey what is causing this it's the it all goes back to my childhood of like losing it all not doing things correctly and just losing absolutely everything the more i hold on to that generational fear the more I'm just hindering myself. Even when I think about spending, I'm always like, oh my God, am I spending too much? Am I spending too much? Oh my God, am I doing that? It's like, just relax. Trust yourself. Know that you'll be okay no matter what happens. I'm still going to be like actively working through, I guess, that fear of money every day. I think the most important thing is rewiring that scarcity mindset around it. That's how I'm actively working on my relationship with money to make it like a healthy one. Am I the asshole for not being attracted to my husband and speaking to other men? Married to my husband for 13 years now. That's so long. Did not have the most romantic relationship when we first started dating. He's a molecular scientist, which means he's very heady. There is not one single romantic bone in this man's body. Of course, he's always been kind and sweet and considerate. When we first started dating, we would go out on fun dates. Loved hiking, rafting, mountain biking. But when it came to romantic dates, he had no clue. I was the one that would ask him if he wanted to go to dinner. I made the first move when I kissed him. In fact, he didn't even kiss me back. During the first year of our relationship, he was very unaffectionate. I was always telling him how I wanted him to kiss me or hug me. He would just shy away. I clearly underestimated just how shy he was because of the fact that he never initiated anything. At first I thought that he might have been gay, but it was proven wrong when we had done it for the first time. I mean, he went through it and he was excited and it happened. But still, there was always a lack of affection. When we greeted each other, I would be the one to kiss him. He would just put his arm around me momentarily. I wanted to accept that this is just his personality, but I just couldn't. I wanted romance and passion. I just wasn't getting even a little bit of that from him. Not even with his words. He never gave me compliments the way that I did. I would compliment him all the time. If you're wondering if I was attracted to him then, I was. In fact, I was very attracted to him. I was definitely attracted to him physically, yes. He was in great shape at the time that we met, but I was also attracted to his mind. He was very determined and disciplined. He was also incredibly intelligent and wrote really well. For all of these reasons, I fell in love with him. He also did treat me well, although he wasn't as affectionate as I wanted him to be. But it just kept getting worse and worse. I would be the one to spend the night at his place all the time. He never offered to come over to my apartment. So eventually, I moved in with him. This led to us fighting almost every single night because he never wanted to do it. I would ask him what was wrong and he would say nothing, I'm just tired. Or he gave me the classic answer of my head hurts. I couldn't believe it because I was definitely out of his league. I was the one that was constantly getting hit on. No matter where I went, I was always getting hit on. He knew this but didn't care. He also happens to not be jealous at all. Which at first I did like this because it meant that we wouldn't have problems about him being controlling or not trusting me. But eventually I started thinking that it meant he didn't care if other men hit on me. Therefore he didn't care if I talked to other guys or cheated on him. When I 
asked him one time if he would forgive me if I cheated. He said, yeah, of course. I also have many male friends and I would hang out with them all the time. And I know that this is probably stupid, but I wanted him to get jealous and he never did. He would say, go have fun, which at the end of the day, I know is a blessing to be with somebody who is not jealous because he gives you your freedom. But it made me feel like he just didn't care about me. That in combination with the fact that he barely ever touched me, it was really alarming. Finally threatened to break up with him after three years. I told him I wanted a man, a man that was attracted to me, that loved me, that touched me, that kissed me, a man that does all the things he wants to do to his partner in a loving way of course and to this he just said wow that's really annoying that you have to bring that up right now at the time he was working on a thesis and doing a bunch of work stuff I knew it was a very stressful time for him but i wondered why he never wanted to be with me i would think if you're stressed with work you'd want to spend time with your partner and vent to them and be with them but no it was the opposite with him he prioritized his job which i understood when he was working he was always trying to be alone fast forward and we've been together 12 years he still is kind and considerate and loving he'll make me food wash my clothes i do plenty of things for him as well but I'm the more romantic one so I'm constantly trying to ask him if he wants to go out on a date but the problem is I've lost all attraction to him he doesn't prioritize his health anymore so he's gained weight of course I never want to make him feel bad so it's not like I can tell him hey can you get back in shape recently I started hanging out with old friends and this led me to seeing older older friends Two of them being men that I knew were attracted to me back in the day. One of them didn't realize I was married and asked me out on a date. I was so tempted to say yes, but I did give him my number. He's been texting me and it's been exciting. He voices how attractive he thinks I am. And yes, he knows that I'm married, but it's still just fun. I want to experience some sort of passion. I want to be held and loved. I want to be desired. Is that so bad? I told my husband that I needed more from him, i.e. passion. And he basically told me that wasn't in the cards with us. That we're at a point in our relationship where we're a married couple. And that married couples don't have passion in their relationships. Therefore, I should just get used to it. Another old friend started texting me and I've been texting him consistently. It makes me feel good to be desired by these guys. I don't feel guilty at all. Should I stop talking to them? Or should I divorce my husband? What should I do? Self-care sister out. Theater bitches are some of the pettiest motherfuckers I've ever met, myself included. Like, I'm not even especially in high school because all the theater mommies are still involved and they did not like me. Like, the so trigger warning, big forehead, mega mind your business. So, my junior senior year, which I did together, the musical was Once Upon a Mattress. And I played the queen, which is actually fucked up if you know that show. The main character, her only personality trait is being a loud pick me. She's not, she's not a normal princess. She's loud and obnoxious. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Red but the theater mommies didn't like me, so I was never the lead. Whatever. In theater, there's a thing called Tech Week, which is basically like where you run the show over and over again, make sure you know your blocking, your dances, your songs. Or a family trip planned for a while to go to Texas, right? Except the week was Tech Week, so that's like a big. Eh. Theater mommies had a fit, director had a fit, but at the end of the day, they were like, "Yeah, go do your trip, you'll be fine. We'll just have an un your understudy go on for Tech Week." Whatever Tech Week happens, I have a great trip in Texas. I come back, we do the sits pro, which is where like you add the band like to the performance. My director was like, "The one thing though is if you go on this trip and you don't know your shit when you get back, your understudy's." going on but like of course i need my shit because like obviously i know my shit like girl who the fuck are you talking to when i got back my understudy was still reading my lines trying to memorize everything like practicing my dances as i'm performing and it was pissing me the fuck off i know i know my lines you know i know my lines so like you're just wasting your time like you're not going on i'm the queen me and this person also had the same gym class so like i was running the track because you know i was i was also an athlete coming to my and me being a petty little bitch i ran around the track and i ran to where the theater girlies were sitting and of course they didn't like me and i bent down and i was like hey you know that like i know my lines right like you're just wasting your time at this point like i'm like i'm going on and they're like hey you know better to be safe than sorry no see now you're offending me because the only way that you're going on stage is if i don't know my shit and i don't my shit. and i was like okay well it's your time not mine and i was cast for a reason Oh, I'm gonna twist it, okay? I am not defending those actions. Like, that was fucked up. Like, I did not need to say that. I was just a petty little angry 16 year old. I was an angry fucking teenager, dude. Go figure. Am I in the wrong for not doing anything to prevent my female 35 husband, male 35, from cheating with his work wifey, female 25? So, I met work wifey last Thursday at a Christmas party. She introduced herself as work wifey and she called my husband work hubby and told that to everyone. When she saw me, she just exclaimed, Oh, we're like two totally different people. How weird is that? Not weird at all. We don't know each other. No, I mean like because X and I get along so well, like we totally get each other and have a lot in common, like totally. That's why he's like my work hubby. I didn't know what a manic pixie dream girl was, but apparently she was one and apparently it was something to brag about. I just found the whole thing very amusing, but on our way home, it wasn't very amusing anymore. I felt a little bit of an ache watching my husband's profile, wondering what was going on in his head. He has told me about his new colleague that he got along with. He told me that she was great at her job and that she was a gamer like him. I don't even know how to hold a joystick properly. I know that they text a lot too, even on weekends. I never thought about that before now. I found myself sat on the toilet seat at 3.30 in the morning, scrolling through his phone in total silence not to wake him up. She's very youthful and quirky. Her words, not mine. She's very funny too. Again, her words, not mine. She calls him hubs and hubby in every text. 
And in one text, she warned him that men fall easily for her and that she just wanted to give him a heads up. I guess it's because she's a youthful, quirky, funny, maniac, pixie dream gamer girl. Her last text was from the same evening that we left. She wrote that she was pissed that he didn't say goodbye before leaving, and I was a bit surprising to her because she didn't expect him to have this type. OMG, your wife is so boring, I didn't expect that. I felt ashamed when I came to my senses, cowering over his phone and reading very weird juvenile messages instead of being sound asleep beside my husband that makes me safe in our relationship, but I couldn't help but agree with manic wifey in some parts. Why is he continually engaging with her? He doesn't flirt back nor does he initiate conversations, but he just doesn't really shut her down. My husband can be stupid and not noticing flirting, but I feel that this is just beyond stupid. Does he enjoy the attention or worse? Does he reciprocate it? In that case, she's not wrong. What is he doing with someone like me who's totally different from whatever is going on between them? Today, I have my usual lunch with my mom, aunt, sister, and sister-in-law. They said I was an a-hole for not nipping it in the bud, and by it, they mean the budding affair. I disagree and try to explain that I couldn't be in a relationship where I needed to stand guard to keep away my temptations. I want a marriage where he is with me because he wants to be with me, and if he cheats, then he doesn't want to be with me. My mother was the one who got the most upset and called me a moron and said I'm an a-hole and, and said that this wasn't the mature thing to do. I need to tell my husband to end his friendship because if I didn't, then I let him cheat. So, am I in the wrong?